Okay, so uh, let's uh, get started. Um, just to make sure everything is still working. So uh, tap the yes button if you can see both the slides and the hear my voice. If there are any issues, type them in the chat or speak out. Nice, so uh, let's get started then. So today is about uh, 2D and 3D graphics with Android. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, just an in brief intro to, to, to computer graphics and some concepts that will be useful to know. Uh, I know some of you are taking the graphics course, so you will have some familiarity with uh, some of the, at least the 3D concepts we're touching on. Uh, but it could be still a nice uh, refresher for you, or if you don't remember all of the basics. Uh, if not, you won't necessarily gain as much from the uh, last section. That's why I'm doing it last. So if you feel like you know 3D graphics, and the basics really well, then you can, you know, go and do whatever you want. But uh, there might still be some benefits still in uh, just getting a quick refresher of the very basics, especially since you're going to start with the second assignment and um, also have the exams later. Uh, other than that, we're going to look at 2D graphics with Android. So we are going to work on the example that we worked on uh, yesterday. And um, go. We're going to create a custom view and do some 2D drawing. So uh, as you see, this is a chart with expense distribution. So our goal is to create our own custom view that can show a pie chart of all the expenses that we have been working on over the past uh, couple of sessions. So we want to show like who has been paying the most in a visual way, and there's no built-in pie charts. So we are going to have to make and implement our own. So we're going to create our own view. And then we're going to do the 3D graphic stuff. Um, yes. So let me just open the chat and everything. So I just have it accessible. And close this one. There we go. OK, so computer graphics. Uh, as programmers, this can be uh, very familiar, uh, but still a bit of an uncharted territory. So um, everyone here probably plays or have played a video game at some point, and you're going to be able to say, uh, this game has good graphics, or this game has terrible graphics. Uh, this game looks good, it looks bad, uh, it's got really cool effects, but uh, the models look like crap, or like the facial animations, when they talk, they don't look like real people, but the, when they, you know, ragdoll, they just look stupid. You know, we can re recognize a lot of this, uh, you know, beauty, beauty and uh, whether or not something looks good. But when we try to create it ourselves, for example, you know, we want to create our own 2D game or 3D game, we often end up with something like programmer art that looks absolutely hideous. And... Uh, so while we know what looks good, we're not necessarily able to create something that looks good at any time. So as programmers, we are often susceptible to creating stuff like this when we actually want to create something that looks good. Um, so what does good even mean when we talk about graphics like that? Um, it can be defined with many things, I would say. For example, is it realism? Do we care about it looking as real? Uh, as good as possible in terms of the real world. Uh, do we want to have a good style? Like, do we want to be consistent style, uh, executed well? So do we care about the execution? Did they nail every single part of the art and the style? So did they make uh, every, the world they're creating look consistent? Does all of the art feel like it belongs in the same place? Um, for example, if it's a very cartoony world, do the characters feel cartoony? And does that look good? Like, have they nailed that particular aesthetic, is that more important or is it the realism? Or maybe it's just the readability, like can you see what stuff is? Like, can you see if it's a building in a strategy game or a unit? Can you see what kind of a unit this, it is from a distance in a battle? Because that's gonna be important as a player as well to be able to know uh, what kind of unit it is uh, at speed. So depending on the game or the application, uh, you might want to prioritize different things. For example, in a mobile application, you don't necessarily want your UI to be realistic. 
for example, you want, don't want to like render shiny metal buttons that look like they uh, are real buttons on your screen. Um, or you might want to do that depending on the style of your app. But usually in mobile, you have, at least on the, in modern times, you have a lot more of a flat art style. Uh, so Google promotes material design, uh, which is a very flat uh, sort of art style. And you could say that that looks good in that context. Maybe it wouldn't look as good in, the, in a game or another application. So you can, so it's really hard to define a good graphics. So can it be subjective? Or is it mostly objective when we talk about good graphics? So is there graphics that everyone can objectively agree that, okay, this looks good? Or is most graphics just subjective? Or in the other way, is the graphics that everyone can agree looks bad? Maybe that's easier. Um, to be to agree on than the other way. So, the first game uh, with computer graphics was implemented in an oscilloscope, which is a device like this, and it was called Tennis for Two. So this is the tennis field. This is the line that is the net, and then there's this ball uh, bouncing back and forth, and you would hit some sort of weird buttons. And this happened way back in like the 1950s. And this computer was pretty big, even though this is all you had for a screen. So you could say that we come far from this, but maybe in the 50s, this looked amazing. Maybe people would define it as good back then, even though today we would say, oh, this is quite boring. I could create this pretty fast. I mean, I mean you could open paint and create this, even if you're a programmer with terrible art skills. You, you could recreate this somehow. So let's have a look at a couple of examples. Uh, these are three games with vastly different art styles. Um, so you have a fully realistic 3D world, more of a stylized pixel world, and sort of a semi 2.5D sort of art style with a lot of realism and 3D-ish objects. But it's clearly that you would, if you look at this, you would kind of define it as a 2D game. So I'm going to pop a poll for you guys. Um, let's get rid of this chat and have the poll here. So let's launch this poll. So you're supposed to answer which image has the best graphics um, and what is most important to you when you think about graphics in a game, application, or in general. So bottom left is this one, bottom right is well, that one, and top left is this one. Top right is this one, sorry. I'll leave it open for 10 more seconds. So if you want to vote, vote, you have 10 seconds. The poll should pop up somewhere. I have launched it. So there should be a window or some button where you can see the poll. I don't know how it looks on your end. So. But it should, according to yesterday, it should have just popped open. Yeah, maybe that's the case if you, I don't know if there's a browser client or something, but. Yeah, some more people just got to vote now. So we have 13 out of 16, I think. Yeah, maybe it's because if it's a browser, then that's probably the reason. If you have it installed or use the desktop client, it, I'm sure it would probably have popped up. So. There is a Linux version of this as well. So if you're in the, using Linux, it should still work for you. Anyway, let's end the polling and the share the results. So you should get a result pop up. And if not, I'm going to uh, talk about the results anyway. So it's about a 50-50 split between the top right and the bottom right. And to most of you, it's, it matters more how it feels. Uh, realism was like 0%, so nobody thinks realism is the most important thing. Uh, so that's interesting. 
uh, readability, a lot of you say that, so um, that's a perfectly valid option as well, because like you can see, for example, the bottom left, it is quite readable in terms of, you can see this is a character, you don't necessarily, well, these are probably banners, and the world and the background is pretty clearly separated. Likewise here, but here's the lighting that uh, actually adds a lot to the readability because the silhouettes make it obvious that this is a tree. You can see the horses and the fence very easily. And I mean, I guess this was a bad uh, example, as well, uh, bad screenshot. Um, so there's a lot going on here. So you could say this is not particularly readable, but uh, the game is good. So if you're interested, you should uh, you should try it out anyway. It looks better when you actually play it. But yeah, and uh, how it yes, it's Factorio. And it's amazing, so you should try it. And this is Hyper Light Drifter, and this is Red Dead Redemption 2, so in case you want to try them out. Uh, and yeah, and consistent style. Um, uh, definitely. So if you have 3D and 2D art mix, that can be really weird. So I would say that's also definitely quite important. And how it feels is probably the most abs abstract uh, option here because it's really hard to nail but that's also also describes uh, the creative process quite well uh, since when you have creating art and or assets for games or applications um, how it feels is often what uh, maybe a creative director would tell you no it feels too uh, uh, feels too slow or feels too uh, explosive and you make it less explosive and that's the kind of directions you would get and it's really hard to interpret, but that's kind of how creative works uh, work too. So uh, it's interesting to see that. Also very interesting that nobody thought realism is the most important thing. So um, anyway, and it's about a 50-50 split between this realistic 3D and the nice pixel art there. So nice, that's interesting. So let's look at a diff few different ways of doing graphics. So you have the concept of vector or raster graphics. Uh, so vector graphics contain infinite detail, more or less. Uh, they're perfectly uh, defined by maths with continuous and perfectly smooth lines. So uh, in vector art, you would have perfect letters. You can zoom into this very corner and see, uh, see the corner be perfectly sharp. Um, whereas in rasterization, uh, the detail is limited by the number of pixels. Uh, it's faster to render and process because the data is just already there. You don't have to interpret uh, the math and create it. Uh, file sizes can often be larger because, well, you have all of the data there and just instead of just defining the points and their uh, curves, their angles. Uh, and, you know, second, the third option for rasterization is that your monitor uses pixels. So, and when working with graphics, uh, especially uh, for games or applications, rasterization make a lot of sense because it maps more or less one-to-one -to, -one to the pixels on your monitor. So it's um, quite natural to work within in the digital medium. So for print and uh, uh, when you go, if you make magazines or stuff like that, then vector art often makes sense because you don't have the concept of pixels on a newspaper, for example, or have a uh, magazine about cars or uh, architecture. So you can use vector vectors for your shapes and your text and make sure you get, you're not limited by resolution when you want to print out crisp, uh, crisp art because everyone's probably printed out a pixelated image at some point and it looks pretty ugly. So, for, um, so vector graphics often work better there. You can also use vectors in and stuff like this in games and real time rendering, but um, uh, it, the algorithms for rendering it is a lot are a lot more advanced. Uh, the second thing we can consider is hardware or software rendering. So, with hardware rendering, you're rendering on the GPU on your graphics card, uh, and this requires that you, when you write the code to do this, it has to interface through a graphics driver and an API. So, so for examples for graphics APIs are OpenGL, Vulkan, and DirectX. So in the, those of you who are taking the graphics course are working with OpenGL. Uh, most of you have probably heard about DirectX since it's uh, the one by Microsoft that works and runs on Windows only. So a lot of Windows games only games use DirectX as their graphics uh, API, and Vulkan is the one of the newer ones uh, that also is cross cross platform. So, uh, but the the clue here is that um, the graphics driver is what does a lot of the work 
and then your graphics card is the one that executes the code. Uh, so hardware rendering is a lot faster, but it uh, only knows about the current primitive. And a primitive can be a thing like uh, a point, so just a single point, uh, a line between two points, so you can have a line drawn. Uh, or we will look more into this later, what the primitive is when we get to the 3D part. On the, other, on, the, on the other hand, you have software rendering. So this executes on the CPU. So it's naturally slower because a, a CPU has a lot less cores than uh, your graphics card. Uh, it's technically more flexible since uh, you don't have to worry about uh, moving data back and forth between different compute units. Um, and uh, you can control all of the memory yourself and you can manage all of the data as you are used to in a regular program. So in that way, it's simpler to get started with. Um, since you already also have all of your scene data on the software, you know everything about your scene, which means you can basically uh, do a lot of pre-processing that would be impossible on the graphics cards, which only works on like one element at a time. Uh, but on the other hand, it's your responsibility to draw all of the uh, primitives, like the lines and the triangles. So this is a sort of a video that describes the difference in CPU rendering and the GPU stuff. So I'm going to try to turn on share computer sound, and we're going to try to watch it. Uh, and then you have to tell me if you can actually hear hear the audio or not. So the question is, can you hear the audio? OK, I will try to turn it up. Uh, OK. Well, I can try to put my microphone next to my speaker. And he's going to paint a picture for you guys in the way that a CPU might do, as a series of discrete actions performed sequentially, one after the other. In three, two, one. Uh, let me speed it up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Leonardo. <laughs> When we hit this trigger on this thing, 2,100 gallons of air goes through these accumulators, out these valves, into all 1,100 of these tubes, into these tubes in which the bottom of is a paintball. Each of those paintballs will fly across seven feet of space and in 80 milliseconds reach its target. Hopefully, when it's all said and done, it's going to paint the Mona Lisa. APU <laughs> painting demonstration. Yep. And 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, science class is now over. Thank So hopefully, let's uh, get the microphone back in order. So yeah, hopefully that worked somewhat. And uh, the clue here is, of course, that the difference is that the CPU does one pixel at a time, whereas the GPU is a very parallel uh, rendering unit, which basically does many pixels at the same time. Yeah, so I guess the FPS was shit, maybe, but uh, hopefully the audio and everything else worked out. So uh, it was an experiment. But if not, the link will be in the slides. You can watch it on your own later if you want to get the real experience. So here is just an example GIF between a software rendering approach for the classic Doom, I think it is, and an OpenGL approach. So the software render is a lot simpler in this case because, well, it's got less performance, so you can do less computation. And the OpenGL one has sliding and a lot more stuff to it. So, And you'll also see here that uh, the graphics card does a lot more blending between the pixel values, whereas the CPU is more 
uh, jagged. So the next two different types of rendering you could think about is uh, real-time rendering or pre-rendered rendering. So real-time rendering is often used in games and visualization in your GUI software. Um, and performance is very critical for this because you want it to be real time. So you want, you want to achieve at least 60 frames per second in most cases. Uh, sometimes hardware can be a limiting factor here. So you might want to scale down to 30 um, or even less. Uh, but uh, you will have to often make it less realistic due to those trade-offs. So you can't do perfect uh, ray tracing or other advanced rendering techniques that produce a lot more realistic images because then it wouldn't be real time anymore. So it uses rasterization techniques to fake it. So we basically, uh, we will get back to it a little bit later. Uh, and recently, however, we are starting to see more ray tracing in real time too with the new NVIDIA RTX cards, even though uh, still we can't do an entire game with pure ray tracing, unless of course it's, I guess it's a very simple game. But we're starting to see more of it in real time as well now. Or we have pre-rendered uh, images used often in like Hollywood films, filmmaking, TV shows, anywhere where quality is a lot more important because you are not limited by 60 frames per second. It can be like two hours per frame. Um, and that's what you often end up doing. So performance is important because you still want to produce uh, many high quality images as fast as possible. But the quality is like the... A deciding factor. That's the reason you want to go pre-rendered to get better quality. So you can compute everything needed for realism. You can have uh, perfect ray tracing. You can have bounce lightning. So when lightning hits the surface, it will uh, bounce and share splashes color uh, in a secondary ray. Um, you can have um, atmospherics. You can have volumetric lighting. So light that goes through smoke. You can render smoke, fire, uh, and a lot more stuff in general with um, because you have the time to do so. So uh, many, so what like film makers do is they have usually like, they can have whole render farms with maybe like hundreds of computers that each render one frame. And then each frame can take anywhere from like 15 minutes to 24 hours. And, but since you have a hundred computers doing all of those frames, you end up doing be able to do 100, 100 frames in 24 hours instead of just one. So you usually use many, many computers to do each frame here. And some examples. So this is a very basic scene. But if you look at, especially at the shadows, you will be able to see that the shadows here are not as uh, detailed. Uh, you will see uh, the lighting as well. But this one gets uh, reflected light on this side. So it's uh, you get the light from the ground reflecting and bouncing back onto the cube. And here you don't get any of that. So even if it's a basic, very simple scene, you can see that the, the pre-rendered stuff is able to add a lot more detail and realism to the scene. Uh, so a quick look at GPU, ar GPU architecture. So you know, it's a very parallel architecture, which means it's designed to run uh, many tasks at the same time on a lot of data at the same time. So uh, it works on both data in parallel and it does different tasks in parallel. So when we go a little bit further in the 3D uh, graphics part, we will see that, um, uh, see the pipe, like the stages that the graphics card goes through when rendering a regular image. So, but uh, it's designed to be that. It has a lot more cores than a CPU, like a lot more. And what, what you're learning in, in operating systems about cache, like L2, L1 cache, uh, GPUs have that too. Uh, and it has its own memory that's called video RAM. So it, on your CPU, you have just RAM. On your GPU, you have VRAM or video RAM. So it's still sort of RAM, just uh, it has its own because if it had to read the CPU memory, then it would have to go a long way. However, on mobile, uh, VRAM and RAM are the same thing. They use a unified memory model. So you have zero overhead on mobile to uh, read graphics memory because they are exactly the same as the CPU's memory. So uh, RTX 2080, which is one of the latest cards from NVIDIA, have about 4,000 cores to work with. Now your regular CPU has maybe from four to eight to 16. Um, so you can see that there's a lot more computing power here. And of course, there's a, there are limitations as well. You can't write programs the same way you do on a CPU because um, 
it's a parallel architecture, so it's designed to work on everything in parallel. So this is an image of NVIDIA's Pascal architecture. So with the L2 cache in the center, then you have each individual core. It's sort of this green uh, dot. And that's inside of a sort of a, uh, a separate unit, like a grouping of cores, which is inside of a shader module. And the shader module has a cache and then each uh, grouping inside those shader modules have separate, uh, so there's, there are three levels of cache here uh, that these cores sort of are using. And each core can work on separate pixels. So if you think about this, then like if it's four by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, four by eight or four by nine, that's 32 cores for each one. And so each shader model here becomes 64 cores. And then you have 64 cores multiplied by each one of those guys and the same and the same and the same. So you end up with a lot of cores. And it's actually possible to visualize this architecture which, with a special kind of shader. So I'm going to show you that right now. So there's a, I'm going to end the full screen for a moment. So there's, so this is the architecture of a, an NVIDIA Pascal GPU. And I happen to have a GPU like that. So inside, so I'm going to run a program now, now, which sort of tries to visualize this. So I don't know if this is going to be readable, but hopefully it is. So this, the way that it works, I'm not going to go into detail about that, but if you look at how this is rendered, I mean, maybe it's not going to work. Um, if this is breaking, then I will not stop this. Uh, is it working for you guys? Because I just lost the... Uh, okay. Okay, well, anyway, so this pattern that we see here looks a lot like the one in in the architecture. So if we cycle through different modes, we can start to see that the blue blue guys are sort of in the same uh, working together. So that's kind of the core we are observing. And we're starting to see as we granularize this more and more, we can start to see that these cores represent what we have in the architecture and we should go all the way down. So there is a single blue square in each of these fields. It's very hard to see probably, but I can hit the button to sort of move this around, which lets us see, which sort of moves this around uh, from, from the different cores. Uh, so if we go to this one, and go all the way back. We can start moving through them. And if I move it far enough, and we will actually get to see that there are 64 cores in each of this. And each of those larger blocks actually correspond to each one of these shader uh, modules. So uh, that's a way, that's a program where we can visualize our GPU architecture. So before this was public, programs like this would have been written to. Uh, so you know, programmers could figure out the architecture of the GPU without actually knowing about it. So, um, but now we can actually see the architecture and we see that it corresponds perfectly to this image more or less. So that's just an interesting, interesting side effect. But um, uh, let's uh, move on from this mobile GPUs. Uh, so quickly about those, a regular desktop GPU would normally draw the entire image at once. So we draw the entire screen at once. Uh, whereas mobile GPUs often use something called a tiled architecture, which subdivides the image into a uniform grid. So like a grid like this would be a chunk in this top left corner. Then there would be another chunk of the same size and each of those would be rendered separately and combined to the final image. So this reduces memory usage and bandwidth, which is important on mobiles. Uh, which, and overlapping triangles, that's a negative thing. They, if they are overlapping multiple uh, tiles, then they might be draw, end up draw, being drawn multiple times. But so it, that does uh, works a bit differently. So that was a quick introduction to graphics in general. Uh, let's move on to the Android stuff. So this is going to be uh, maybe the most exciting part. That's going to be mostly applicable to directly to your projects and uh, your assignments. So in Android, uh, if you want to draw in 2D, you will be drawing on something called a canvas. Uh, the, X co the coordinate system of a canvas starts in the top left corner, uh, and then the y-axis goes down, and the x-axis goes to the right. 
So you would have a y, one, two, three, four. So this is different from a regular uh, coordinate space in maths, where it would be uh, the y-axis would be going upwards. But if you work with the SM, SFML uh, with uh, burnt in math for programming last year, you would will be familiar with this coordinate system. Uh, so the canvas is where you draw. Uh, then you use a class called paint to describe the look of your draw. Uh, you can set things like color, whether it should be anti-aliased or not. And you can add borders and change the fonts and do other things like that. And then there is a series of draw functions like draw circle, draw square, draw text functions that you use to describe what to draw. So paint is how it looks, canvas is where you draw it, and the draw functions describe what you want to draw. And all the Android UI elements are implemented uh, by drawing on some sort of a canvas. So buttons are basically rectangles with text. Uh, obviously, there's a bit more styling and stuff involved. Uh, but uh, that's more advanced stuff. So. so you can do put canvas. So canvases are often part of custom views. So if your application requires special visual elements, uh, for example, you need to create a music application, you need to visualize a piano or guitar strings. Uh, there are no built-in views to draw this, so you will have to maybe create your own way of uh, drawing and visualizing uh, these elements. Or if you want to have graphs or meters, uh, some sort of, you know, just anything where you would need to have something custom. For example, if you want a triangular button, there are no default triangular buttons. So, yeah, you have both rectangle buttons and circle buttons already, so if you want different shapes and things, you might want to implement that yourself. Um, <clears throat> or if you have a group of expenses and you want to show a chart of who paid what. <clears throat> so that's what we're going to do. Uh, and you must inherit from the view class or any of its uh, child classes. So you can if you want to make a different kind of button, you can uh, inherit from button and create a different kind of button. Or inherit from imagery if you want to create a triangular image or a circular image or something like that. Uh, you can define your own attributes in XML and then read them in the view. So if your view requires specific attributes, you can deal with that. Uh, also, you must manage the size of the view yourself and its positioning with it in the allowed space. So when you set the wrap parent or match parent in the XML, uh, it's the view's responsibility to like uh, adhere to that. So we will look at that when we go to the coding. So for example, a chart, we are going to add a chart to our application to show the distribution of how much each person has paid. So this is the end result. We're going to do create an expense distribution that shows how much each individual person in our expense list have contributed. And we're going to put the names on the side. So uh, it's not necessarily uh, the most beautiful graph. Um, it's just the very basics to teach you how to uh, get started with the paint and the canvas and the drawing. Uh, so if you want to take it further, you can do that. So there's some tasks for after where you can implement data binding for this chart based on what we talked about yesterday. So for example, to automatically set the data for the chart, you can create a data binding for that. And you can try to make it look prettier and maybe show the values on the different slices of the pie as well. So let's do that before we move on to 3D graphics. So. Um, yeah, so we will be right back here. Um, the only difference from yesterday, let's just make a commit before class. So the only difference from yesterday is that we have added a new fragment called the expense chart fragment. I have added a view model for this chart called chart view model. All it has is a database and a value called total per person. And total per person is a query that selects all the expenses and groups them by name. So basically, if Carl is, uh, has two values, then they will be sort of added together and uh, clustered. And we're ordering by the name, so we just get a consistent order in our chart. We could also order by amount here, technically, so we get uh, the biggest slices of the pie first. Uh, but those are the yeah, only differences. So our starting app today uh, basically looks like what we had yesterday, except we have the chart on the bottom menu as well. 
and we have just some a card here without anything else. So what we want to do is create our own view and draw draw it in here. So let's get started with that. So the first thing we're going to have to do according to our presentation is that we need to inherit from a view class. Uh, so we're going to have to create one. So um, it's already created. I have a new module here package called views. And in here we have a file. So we would go new file and just call it something. I'm going to call it pie chart view. Uh, it's an empty class, so we will get to that. So let's write it. Let's call it pie chart view. Uh, and it needs to take two parameters. One is the context, and the other one is the attributes. So attributes are basically uh, when you, for example, create an image view, you can set the type of image, you can set uh, the width and the height of the image and stuff like that. So that's what is in the attribute set. And we have to inherit from the view class and pass those parameters on. So at the very basic level, we now have a custom view. So if we go to our fragment expense chart XML, we have this stuff. So we want to create our chart at the very bottom. So we can add a pie chart view. And we're going to make the width match this card and the height. Well, for now, let's say that it's just going to be 200. And we're going to give it an ID. That's going to be called, we're just going to call it pie chart. And that's it. So now we have created our own view and we put it in here, but not, it's, uh, it doesn't draw anything. So it's, uh, so there's no, so even though it's there, it's, so we see it takes some space, but it's not actually anything there. Uh, quickly check for questions. Nothing. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to actually implement the drawing and we want to be able to do use the data from our database. Uh, but first we need to add some uh, information to this view because it doesn't do anything. So the first method that we're going to override, uh, let's just, it's the most visual one. So let's just start with that one. So we can override function called on draw. And this is the one that provides us with the canvas. So just to do something really quick, we can go canvas dot draw. And here you have all the functions. You can draw an oval, an arc, a circle, uh, a bitmap, uh, or just a color. So this is basically going to fill the entire uh, canvas. You can draw lines, you can draw uh, pictures, you can draw paths, rectangles, round rec rounded rectangles, text vertices. So you can ha you have a lot of options on what you want to draw. So just to have something on here, we're just going to draw a circle. And that takes a coordinate, so zero, zero. And we're going to, so those are floats. And we're gonna make the radius be 25. And as you can see, it takes a paint as the last parameter. So we need to create a paint. So I'm gonna create a paint in here. So I'm gonna call, make it a private val. That's gonna be called, uh, let's call it chart paint. And it's going to be a class of type paint. Um, so we want to set the color of this. So I'm going to use dot apply, uh, which is a function in Kotlin that you can call on anything, which basically we, we have this object and then we apply some operations to it. And then in the end, it ends up returning the same object. So this is a nice way to initialize it and then do something to it and then have the final uh, modified result in this variable. So the things you normally want to set is the color. Uh, so you can set this to color. You can set it to any pre-made color like magenta, green, blue, whatever. Or you can set it, set it to value off. 
and pass in red, green, and blue values. So for now, to be simple, we're going to just say color.red, and that's all we're going to do. So all we're going to do now, oh, we have to specify the paint in here. So chart paint. So the paint describes how it's going to look, and the canvas is where we're going to draw, and this function says what we're going to draw. So we're going to draw a circle. So there it says our circle, like it's at zero, zero. So we remember that's the top left coordinate. 75% uh, of the circle is now outside of the, uh, the, our view. So let's just move it 50 pixels in and also increase the radius to 50, just so we can see the entire circle. So there's our circle. So now we've created our own very basic view that just draws a circle in the top left corner. Um, so we obviously want a little bit more than that. And if you go to the expense chart, the, uh, the XML, you can see that you also can get to preview your view here. So you can actually see what it looks like with the XML. Uh, so we can see that it's just a circle. Um, however, there's a bit more work that we need to do on our end. So right now we just have a paint and on draw. But as mentioned in the slides, we need to also specify um, we need to handle the size of our graph, our um, chart ourselves. We don't know. We can't just go with 50 and assume that our view is going to be 50, uh, 50 wide, because if it's not, then this is wrong. So there's the other function that we have to override to manage this. And that function is called on size changed. And on size changed is basically uh, the function that decide, that gives you uh, the current size of the view, and you have to use that to compute uh, what you can, what you, uh, how you can draw it. So we get the width and the height, and the old width and the old height. So what we want to do is want to make sure that we can draw our pie chart uh, as big as the size allows us to do. So. Uh, if this is the height of our view, which is currently 200 dp, then we want the radius of the circle to be half of this. So we just, and we want the center of the circle to be in the middle, just so we can see the entire thing. So that's the stuff we have to manage ourselves. So let's start by doing that the very much uh, straightforward way we can think about. So that's a width and a height. Two questions in the chat. Okay. Yeah, we can have a break. No worries. Let's have a break until um, um, six minutes past. I'll, I'll just put a timer on the stream and give you about give you about five minute break, and then we can keep going. Uh, you can use colors from XML, yes, but um, uh, that means you actually have to implement that on the graph yourself so that it actually uses those. It's not the supported default, but you can use to do that. Yeah. So let's just do a quick break. I will go a five min, five minus four min, five. So when the timer is up, the break is over.
Okay, so I'm gonna give everyone about uh, 10 more, 20 more seconds so we can make sure everybody's back. So if you're already back, then just hit the yes button or say so in chat or somewhere else. There's a raised hand, I guess that was, is it a question or is it uh, just the yes button? Yes. <laughs> I didn't even know, I don't even see the raised hand button. But... Well, if there's a raised hand button at least. So I get a notification if you click the raised hand button. So if you have a question and I, or if you said something in the chat and I haven't seen it, uh, I guess you can click the raised hand button and I will get a notification. So I know that, uh, yeah, like that uh, Jung Gunnar managed to do it as well. So if you do that, then I will check the chat. So, or that, that I will be notified. Yep, but seems everyone's back. So I will go back to it. And I will try to keep the chat open on the side here as well. You will probably just have a gray box, but that part is not so important anyway. Yep, so the next thing we have to do once we've, so now we're basically drawing a red circle, but we are not, we don't know how big it is allowed to be. So in on size change, this is where we have to calculate uh, the size of our view, like, or, so this can depend on what you want to do. For a chart, we just want it to be as big as possible. So it's going to be seen on screen. So we want to make sure that we have a valid radius. So I'm going to create a, another member variable called being a private variable. I'm going to call it bounds and that's going to be the bounds of our graph. So this is going to be the area within we are allowed to draw and the type of that is going to be a rect f. So it's going to be a rectangle which means it has a left, top, right and bottom. It has four values that describes the top left, the, the top the rightmost value, the top value, and the bottom the coordinate. So this is basically going to be where we are allowed to draw. So at the very simplest uh, part, let's simply say that the left is our, is gonna be zero. So we're gonna start at zero. We're going to say that right is going to be, uh, the width to float. We're gonna say that uh, the top is gonna be zero. And we're gonna say that the bottom is gonna be height. So that is uh, not the best way to calculate it as we will see, but uh, it will get us started. So now instead of using CX and CY when we're drawing a circle, uh, we're also gonna change the function to draw an uh, to the other thing, which is called draw oval. An oval takes a rectangle as its first parameter. So now we can pass in our bounds and we can pass in our chart paint. So this oval should now be uh, the same size as the view. So we do indeed have um, something that's the same size as the view. But normally we want pie charts to be circular and not ovals. So we have to make a few adjustments to how we calculate its size. So uh, usually we want it to be positioned in such a way that um, the shortest side is what's gonna be the final radius and not, uh, we don't want it to be different on the X and the Y axis. So when we work with this, we have to fight, figure out what's the minimum value of the width and the height. So let's just do that. Uh, the radius is equal to the minimum value of the width and the height uh, to flow. So that's not imported. Let's make sure we import it. And we want to convert the result to a float. And in here, we want to set this one to be uh, the radius. Well, technically, I guess it's not the radius, but. The point is we now have a perfect circle that is uh, just as big as the smallest side. And that's what we want to do achieve. 
however, this has a few problems. Uh, so if we go to our XML, I will show you what that is. So we have a perfect preview of this. Uh, so if we want to add some margin to this, which is outside of the view, we want to add like 25 dp of margin. That seems to work fine. Um, so no problems there. If we set the width to wrap content, um, it still works. Uh, but if you want to add padding, so if you're going to add 50 dp of padding, uh, nothing happens. So, and that's because uh, padding is something we have to add ourselves. So if you want to support padding, we have to take that into account manually. Um, so we can no longer say that our left is going to be zero in case there's some padding here. So we are going to have to co co compute the padding. So, so let's do that. Uh, let's say that the padding horizontal is equal to, so we have uh, variables in this view called padding. So we can actually just figure that out. So we have the left padding plus the padding right. So by adding the left and the right padding together and converting it to a float, we now have our horizontal padding. So the left part of the view then, um, actually just becomes the left padding. So that's where we want to start uh, our start our graph. And we have to convert it to a float. Um, also, instead of having to write bounds dot bounds dot bounds dot every time, we can use the same trick as we did here with apply. So let's do bounds dot apply. And then we can get rid of all of these guys like so, and just operate directly on the object without that because uh, it's tedious to write that every time. And on the top, we're going to use the padding top as our starting point to a float. Um, however, our radius can no longer be the minimum of the width and height. Uh, we're going to have to use the horizontal and the vertical padding. So let's add our vertical padding as well. So that's the top plus the bottom padding. And the radius is now going to min be the minimum of those two values instead. And we want to use the min float function. Oh, now the imports are screwing up, so let's make sure we do that properly. And that's the minimum of float and float. So what we have now is that the radius is now the minimum of the space of the paddings. Uh, but that's not what we want. Uh, it's not going to be very big now. Uh, it hasn't updated because we haven't built yet. So we also need to actually take the width and subtract the padding. So our, say if our width is 100 and we have five padding on each side, then this becomes 90. Uh, so we have to take our width and subtract the padding and then then we will get uh, the proper size. So currently, nothing has changed because we're not using padding. But if we add padding to this now, for example, padding left, we want to add 10. We see it actually properly moves 10 to the right. 20 does that. Uh, actually, I see we uh, forgot one thing. Because if we go to 50, we kind of squish the, squishing the graph. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to have our right view also be the radius, but we want to add the uh, the off this left offset. So by adding the left padding, we actually move the right side as much as we're moving the left side. And we have to do the same for the bottom. So it can be a bit tedious to manage this, but thankfully you only have to do it once and every review will be different in terms of how it handles it. So let's just run it as well so we can update. Yes, now it updates. And now it looks correct. So now when we're adding this padding, we can also add it on the right side, which won't do anything because there's so much space on the right already. We can add it to the top to push it down and you can see the circle changes size accordingly. We can add padding on all sides. And you can see it gets squished in pr properly. So that's how you can add padding to it. And you kind of have to do that if you want to support padding from the XML, which you generally want to do, because you can have 
Otherwise, you can't style it as much as you would like. So now we have our bounds. So and we have a circle. So in order to finalize this, we need to somehow split the circle into multiple parts, and we need to have some data to display. So in this case, uh, we now have finished the size change function. This gets called every time the size has changed. So um, um, this should work now, even if you rotate our phone or add more views to the to the layout. So I'm gonna look close this one. And so we have our paint and we have our bounds, but we don't have any data to operate on. So to draw our chart, uh, we're going to create a custom data class inside of the pie chart that represents the data that we're going to call, or we're gonna make it a data class. We're gonna call it just data. So this is gonna be pie chart views data class. And the data should have three things. It will have the name, which is a string. It will have the angle, which is a float. This is how much of the chart it's going to take. And finally, we have a color uh, so that we can uh, give the different sections of the pie different colors. So this represents each section in the pie. Um, paint used to draw the pie. And these are the bounds of the pie. Uh, another thing that we can do, uh, it's hard to see on this one because the, the resolution is so high. Uh, but this paint, if we had a low resolution phone, it would have really jagged edges because we don't apply any anti-aliasing. So we can actually set its anti-alias to true if we want to enable that. So it's going to, it's going to be impossible almost to see the difference here. But um, if you want smooth edges on the circle, you have to enable it. So if you don't know what anti-aliasing is, I will uh, briefly touch back on that when I get to the 3D stuff. Basically, it smooths, smooths the edges. That's the short version. If you don't want smooth edges, you don't set it to true. Um, yeah, so now we have the day have a class. So we need to store this data on this chart somewhere. So let's create a private variable called uh, the data. Uh, and it shall be of the type a list of data. And we want it to be nullable because it's not always going to be. Uh, it's not always going to be data. For example, just as you create the chart, there's not going to be any data on it. So this is the data we are displaying. Um, nice. So we have the size, we have the data, and we have the paint, and then we have the type of the data. So we need one more thing, and that is a function to set the data, because if we can't set the data from anywhere else, then what's the point of having data? So let's just cre create a function called set data. That takes, uh, the, takes a list, which is going to be, so we're gonna hard code it in this case to be working with expenses. Um, if you don't want it to do that, you would have to, we will change, have to change this function, but I'm gonna make it take a list of expense since that's where, what we're working with in this application. So if not, you could have this take a list of data and then pre-process the data somewhere else. But I'm just going for simplicity, I'm gonna go with a list of expenses. Uh, and we have to convert that list of expenses into uh, our data. So to draw a pie chart, we need to know how big of a percentage each one of these expenses amount to out of the total amount of expenses. So thankfully, uh, Kotlin has a lot of great functional uh, tools to work on lists. So to find the maximum or find the sum of all the values, we're going to say the sum equals the list dot sum, sum by double since it's a uh, floating point values. And we want to use list dot amount, list uh, no, sorry, we want to use it because that's the current element in the list and we want to use amount. I guess I have to go to double. So the sum of all the elements is now gonna be stored in this variable. So we're summing by double and the, what, what we're summing by is the expense. So it is the expense here and we want to do the amount. So now this is the sum and then we want to set our data, which is this list of data. 
we're going to set that to, we're going to use this list of expenses. And we want to use the map, which basically applies. So this is more similar to what we did with the live data transformations, except now it's just uh, regular transformations. If you've used this in math for programming, I know that. But basically, it applies a function to every element in this range, and we could get a new list with the transformed values. So what we want to do is we want to output data where the name of the variable is the element's name. The angle is the amount divided by the sum. So this is how much out of the total sum does this current thing have. And then we want to multiply it by 360 because that's the that's the uh, number of degrees in a circle. And we have to convert it to a float. And finally, this is the color. Uh, I'm not going to do very advanced uh, color stuff here. So we're going to uh, random color. We're going to just assign a random color to everything. So color dot value of. And then we're going to assign a random value to the RG and B components. So we're going to do random dot next float and multiply it by 255 because uh, colors go from 0 to 255 in this case. Uh, not 0 to 1, as some of you may be used to from graphics. And then we're just going to pass in the random color here. So uh, this so this basically assigns our data to this list. And we now have converted our expenses to this data. Uh, so we create a sum to get the total. And then we divide by uh, each amount, how much it amounts to after the total, and multiplies it by 360 to get the angle it's supposed to use. But then there are two functions that we need to call that are important. So anytime the data or something in the view changes, we have to call the function call invalidate. And what that does is it requests the view to be redrawn. So it doesn't actually redraw unless you invalidate it and tell it that, hey, something has changed, so you must redraw me. So when we change the data, then we have to invalidate the view, so it, it uh, redraws. The other thing that we can call is request layout. And what that does is if the size of the view, if this data somehow changes how uh, maybe the size or something else needs to uh, change, then we have to call this to say, hey, we might have to uh, change our size computations based on if there's a lot of data or if there's a lot of other things that we need to take into consideration, we, we need to request the layout again. So we're going to do both here. Uh, say if we wanted to have more text on the sides, we might have to compute recompute the size of the chart. Um, so let's call this function. Um, in our chart fragment, we have the view model with this data. So this is the list of expenses that we're going to apply. So in this fragment, when the activity is created, we're going to access our view model, the total per person, and we're going to observe it. So this is uh, the live data observation. So we're doing this manually now. And we get the list of expenses. So we simply go through our view binding that we looked at yesterday as well. Through the view binding, we're going to access the pie chart and call set data to this data. So every time our database changes now, since this is live data, we're going to update the chart data. So one of the tasks I put in the slides is that you can convert this to data binding. So you don't have to put this code in here. So if you're interested to add data binding to your own custom views, that could be a good exercise to do, and just to get some practice. So now we are setting the data every time the data changes, but we are not currently drawing the data. So if we look at the, look at the chart, it's going to still look exactly the same. So let's stop drawing just an oval and actually draw out our data. Since we pre-computed the, the angle and everything, it's going to be uh, relatively simple to do so. So we have to go through our data and we have to go for each data element we want to do an operation. Uh, and that operation uh, is that we want to draw it. So first we're going to have to update the color of our paint because we default it to red but each data element has its own color. So we're going to set the color of the paint to the data elements color. 
and we have to get that to an int since this color is actually just an integer. But this is a color class. Um, after we've added the color, then we can actually just call the draw function. So on canvas, uh, we're going to draw something called an arc. So an arc is a uh, part of a circle. So it goes from um, 0 to 360, and you can use any part of that. So the first parameter is hidden behind here, but it's a rectangle. So that's our bounds. So this is the maximum size of the arc. We have a start angle. Uh, currently, we're going to put it to 0. We have a sweep angle, which is uh, the, cur the angle of the, like how far are you going to move from the start? And that's stored in our data element right now. So we put it that angle. And finally, we're going to use the center. So yes, we want to use the center of the oval. And the paint is going to be our chart paint. Uh, the only thing is that the start, angel, start angle actually needs to update for every element we draw. So we're going to just create a variable uh, that's called total angle, start initialize it to zero, and use this total angle in here. So we created this one so we can uh, make each pi start after the previous one. And then after we have set it, we must plus to the total angle, uh, the current angle. So if we look at this right now, uh, this basic drawing should give us our pie chart. And it does. Currently, we don't know who each value represents, but we have now drawing an arc for every single uh, of our elements. So that's kind of cool. Let us also just draw the text on the side. Uh, we're going to do it in a very quick way. Um, just so we can proof of concept that it's there. If you want to take it further or build upon this, you can just download the code afterwards and play around with it. So maybe you want to assign more sensible colors. Uh, but we, we have going to have to look at custom attributes. We need to. Uh, just add the text quickly. So. Um, I'm going to create another variable for text y offset, which is going to start at zero as well. And then we're going to basically go canvas.drawText. And we're going to call the name of the data. Uh, the x coordinate is going to be our bounds.right, so basically to the right of the chart. And the y coordinate is going to be the text y offset. Uh, and, the and the paint is going to be our chart paint. So that means it has the same color as the text. And then we're going to take the text y offset and just plus it by some arbitrary value for now, just say 50. Maybe that's a good value. So the text is incredibly small. So the paint actually is also the one that holds the font size. So inside here, we can actually say the text size. And we can set it to something like 32, maybe. That's a little bit small still. That was too big. That's more like it. But then we want to increase the offset as well. So obviously, this is extremely uh, basic and doesn't account for anything, like the number of tech, number of people or anything. So I mean, you're even going to put the offset at like started off at thirty, just to push it down a bit. Yeah, it doesn't even work yet, but we have to move on to other things. But the idea is that you can draw text and you set font size with the paint. So now we know that artwork is here, Arnold is here, Carl is here, Chris is here, Geralt is here, Ida is here, John there. And if we want to, for example, add some money to, uh, say, John, he's a, sl he's a slim green guy in here, we can add some value money to John, say, pay the lots of money. If we add him, like, 5,000. John is now in here with 5,000. And John is now the pink one, so now John is the bigger slice here. And this would also update live in case we uh, were able to add data from this view. Nice. Uh, so to wrap this up, we're going to add uh, one custom attribute to this guy, just to show you that it 
how you do that. So let's to do so, we have to add a file in here. Under values, we have to add a val file called actors.xml. Um, and in here, we have to specify that we want to create an attribute. So we want to declare a styleable, and it's going to be while well, it auto completes the pie chart view. And this, this styleable is going to have an attribute, uh, and we can give it a name. So let's say, I mean, let's say just uh, that it is the, I don't know, any ideas, text size, just the text, maybe text offset, something like that. And we have to give it a format, which is going to be float. And that's it. You can add as many of these as you like, and this is going to only work on the pie chart view. So we call it for text offset. And you do it in a declare styleable. So let's go back to the view. Uh, we now have to implement, I'm going to close these other functions for now, so we can focus on what we're doing. So. In order to process this data, we have to do that in our init. Uh, and so we have these variables coming in through the constructor. Uh, and that's a context and an attribute set. So the attribute set is what stores the attributes. So to access those attributes, we have to go through the context theme and call obtain styled attributes on our attribute set. And also we have to specify that this is on our styleable pie chart. I'm going to import this one. So this styleable pie chart is what comes from, uh, uh, well, I closed it, it comes from actors. So this is the style chart, styleable. So that's the pie chart view. Uh, and finally, there are some defaults and we just put those to zero because we have no sensible defaults. And then we're going to call apply so we can work on this style set. Uh, and basically want, what we want to do here, so we basically what we set is a text offset. So I'm going to create a variable here. Uh, it's going to be a text called text offset equals uh, started at zero. And in here we're going to go that the text offset equals. And we're going to just call get float. So this is a bit like a bundle that you can get float, get boolean, uh, and the type of this depends on what you put in here under the format of the attribute. So let's call get float, and the index is going to be r.styleable.pyChartView and underscore text offset. So it automatically generates the offsets for you. So that's the offset for the pie chart view. And we can set the default value, and that's going to be 0f. Uh, finally, once you're done with all of your attributes, you're going to have to call recycle, because this attribute set is uh, being used by all the other views uh, that come later. So if you have a linear layout, and then an image view, and then the pie chart, all of them are going to reuse the same attribute set. So you have to recycle it at the end to specify that I'm done with it. Uh, and finally, we need to use this attribute text offset. So here we're going to say that we draw out a bounce at right plus the text offset, which means if we run it right now, nothing has changed because we will not have used this attribute. So there's no offset on the text, and the colors are random every time. So it's a, you know, it's a bit weird, but. So yay, random colors. Anyway, um, so now we're going to set this variable in the XML. So now we can specify a text offset. And let's put it to, for example, 40. So if you run it right now, our text should be offset by 40. And it is, so there's a little bit of space here. And we might even put 20 dp. I think that should still work. No, because that's not a float set. Well, for now, let's do 20, 50, and we will see that the, the offset has changed. So that is the short version of how you add your own attributes. You go to the attributes of XML, 
uh, declare your styleable, add as many attributes as you like. And then in this init function up here, uh, you just uh, obtain the styled attributes. And then for each attribute, you just get it and assign it to some variable. And then you use the variable somewhere later. So we could, for example, use this attribute to set the color theme of the chart. Uh, instead of using random colors, we could set specific colors. Uh, we can use it to uh, set the anti-alias for this one. We can set the text size. So we can use that for anything we might want to style. So we just, but we just have to read it in this function. And that's the main idea. Other than that, you can add as many as you like. And that's basically it for our custom view today. Uh, we're not going to add any more to it. But if you're interested, you can take this and take it as far as you like. Currently, it's obviously a bit ugly because of the randomness. But you should have gotten an idea of how to start creating your own views, if necessary. So the summary is basically inherit from view. Uh, you must override on size changed and on draw to process the size. And on draw is basically what draws it. Other than that, you can just provide it with any data and use that to draw it. Uh, in the XML, you can just add your view directly for example, by typing, putting the pie chart view in here. And any custom attributes you want to put on it must be put in, in the attributes.xml under values. So that's probably uh, one of the more technical things that we can do here, since it's a bit low level that you have to compute the padding and all of that stuff yourself. Um, so it's a bit more uh, complicated than a lot of the other things we've been talking about, but it's going to, it's quite powerful if you, uh, you can add animations to this. We're gonna have, uh, there's going to be an session on animations later. So you can animate the chart. You can do a lot of things with this. So if you want to create um, cool visuals, this is uh, one way of doing it. So let's quickly wrap this up by, I will provide the source code as well, of course. Let's wrap it up by going to the final sections, which is just the 3D graphics. So if you've done the graphics course, some of this will be probably familiar to you. And if not, it's going to be a very basic introduction to some terminology. So you're at least familiar with it. So when you're working with 3D, uh, I mentioned in the start that GPUs are very parallel and follow a pipeline. Uh, so that's what 3D rendering works like as well. Um, it follows a series of very defined stages that produces the final image in the end. So each one of these stages is sort of a task that the GPU can do. And for each stage, there's a lot of data that is processed in parallel. So it, the data for each stage is the data parallelism of the GPU and the each separate stage is sort of the separate tasks. So that's the task parallelization. So uh, this one can run at the same time as this one technically, uh, but all the data inside each stage is sort of processed uh, within this stage. Um, so that's the high level overview. And the separate stages are that you first start with a couple of points that get processed in the first stage called a vertex shader. And in here, these points, so if you remember from maths, um, you have uh, matrix multiplications and transformations. So basically what happens here is you have those points and you transform them uh, where you want them to be in 3D space. So for example, I'm gonna show this visually. Uh, if we have a cube, you can apply rotations to it on the X axis, on the y axis or on the set axis. And that kind of, that, those kind of operations are what happen in that first stage. Uh, after that, we generate primitives. That's, we're gonna talk about that next time or like next slide. Uh, rasterizations is when uh, those guys, so if you have a triangle, uh, that triangle in theory has infinite detail. So the rasterization, that's when we take this triangle and dump it into the pixels that it overlaps with. And, oh, okay. Um, well, um, okay, so the mouse pointer cannot be seen, uh, but uh, currently I'm talking about the, so I've been going through the stages from vertices to vertex shader, primitives generation and rasterization. 
So you should be able to follow the text at least. And finally, in the fragment shader, that's where we take those pixels that we got and apply coloring, lighting, and other effects to them. Uh, and finally, that gets written to the screen in the frame buffer. So that's sort of how it works at the short level. Uh, but let's look at some concepts in detail. So a vertex is basically a point in space and you can have other optional data associated with it. For example, it can be a, have a coordinate in the x, y, and z plane, and you can assign it a color, and you can contain any amount of data. For example, you can have uh, some other things on color. You can apply the number of neighboring vertices. You can apply its uh, favorite vertex. You like if it's a person, you can say, hey, I like this other vertex, and put that on there. But, you can put anything you want basically, but normally you always have a position because you need that to render it somewhere. So if we look at it in here, this is a vertex right here. So that point at the very edge, that is a vertex. Um, next thing is a line. It's the second most basic primitive. So a point is the ba most basic one and a line is the second most basic one. Uh, it's drawn between two vertices uh, with a default width of one pixel. Uh, and the default implementation to convert a line into pixels uses a guy called Bressenham's algorithm. Uh, and this, when you do hardware rendering, is implemented by a graphics driver. Uh, but if you do software rendering, you have to implement this algorithm yourself. So what it does is basically you take a line across the grid of pixels and then you figure out sort of which pixels should get the coloring based on uh, how big a chunk of it the line that co covers sort of. So this is the most uh, used line drawing algorithm. And if we go in here, uh, we can think of the line as being, so this is a line between those two vertices and this is a line between the other vertices and in total, we have three lines here. And three lines together, they form a triangle, which is the most complex, but also widely used primitive in 3D graphics. So they consist of three vertices, uh, and they fill all the pixels inside of those vertices. And there are three major cases for drawing them. So if you have a flat top or a flat bottom, you just start at the top and draw lines for every single line to, the, to get to the bottom. And at, at the end, you get to the bottom. So you basically start at the top and draw each line separately. If you have a flat bottom, you do the same from the bottom. And if you have none of those things, you divide the triangle in two. So you get the flat bottom and you get the flat top. And then you can draw, draw flat top from here and down or flat bottom from here and up. So that's more technical, but, but that's how it's implemented if you wanted to do it in a software. And in, when it's rendered, uh, you end up with something like this. So that's a triangle consisting of three points. So this one, this one, and that one. And together they become a triangle. So if you have many triangles together, um, you form advanced surfaces that look realistic. And they're often referred to as meshes or models. So an example of that would be a cube. So a cube consists of many triangles. So as you can see, there's a triangle here, 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 and here. And on the sides here, there are many, many more of them. So if you have a lot of triangles, then it looks then somewhat more advanced. Uh, and likewise, you can also add triangles to things. And now we end up with more vertices, lines, and triangles. So. So that's what you do when you create models. You'd have a lot of triangles that together form the illusion of being a surface. Uh, the next stage after having that is to add lighting and shading, which happens in the fragment stage, uh, where you have to do your own math to compute illuminations of surfaces. Um, and you have three different types of light, usually point lights, spotlights, and directional lights. So let's quickly look at how the three of those look. So 
so first we have the point light. A point light is a light that exists at a single point in space and it illuminates based on that. So we can move the point light around and the, all the light comes from this single point. Uh, second, you have the concept of a spotlight, which you can be familiar with from like theater. Uh, it's basically a single light that illuminates a single circle on the ground and you can change how wide it is and how soft it is. And the final type of lighting is a directional light, which works a lot like the sun in that it comes in from one angle in on all sides. So you sort of have the sun and it just points in, it doesn't matter where you put it. The only thing that matters is its direction. So that's the only thing that matters when, in terms of how the light's gonna look. Uh, so there are many techniques for shadows. I'm not gonna discuss that here, but you, this is where you would also add the shadows. Or finally, there are some, you can pre-render things as. I discussed that you can do that, for example, for a film, you will pre-render a lot. And if you want to create your own 3D images or models, uh, Maya, Blender, 3D Studio Max are some modeling tools for working with 3D. Uh, and then for pre-rendering rendering engines, you, there are things called V-Ray, Octane, Arnold, Cycles, and that's, those are specialized rendering tools for creating images such as these. Uh, and they are different in how they're implemented. but. So some use ray tracing, some don't. And finally in Android, um, for those of you who have done OpenGL, you cannot use regular OpenGL in Android. You have to something called, use something called OpenGL ES, which is basically exactly the same API and shader syntax, but you have limited feature set and functionality. So it's, it's roughly the same as OpenGL 3.3. Or you can use Vulkan, which uses the same API as the desktop graphics, but you have a lot more responsibility on yourself. Now, I won't have time to show you how to do 3D rendering on Android today, but there's a link here. And if you follow it, uh, you can see follow a tutorial on the documentation to see how you can set things up for drawing with OpenGL. And finally, at the end of it, you should be able to um, end up with a triangle on your phone as well. So you can draw a triangle on your phone. Uh, other than that, you can use everything you've learned in graphics to draw on Android as well. So I know that's probably uh, advanced or a lot of information if you haven't worked with graphics before, but hopefully it's, uh, it's at least gonna give you a taste of what the graphics course people are going through uh, and give you some familiarity with the concepts so that if somebody mentions something like that, uh, you are going to be able to at least understand that it's related to graphics. So that's about it for today. We've implemented a custom view, looked at a bit on computer graphics in general and talked about a bit about 3D graphics as well. So unless there are any questions or concerns, um, I'm going to end the session now. seems to be okay. Um, thank you for showing up. Hope you learned something and enjoyed the session and we'll be able to use uh, some of these tools for later. I will upload the video and the project files after this, right after it has processed. So yeah, thank you for coming.